So um, this is Gaston. And Hello, everyone. If you want to introduce yourself real quick. Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Gaston Silva. I'm a software engineer at Riot Games. Um, I've been doing engineering of different kinds for the past um, a little over 10 years. Uh, and right now, my subject matter expertise is in web development. I'm a big enthusiast of open source software. And uh, I'm Steve Myers, and I'm uh, contributing full time to a Bitcoin project called the Bitcoin Dev Kit, which is an open source library for building Bitcoin wallets, on chain wallets. Um, I'm also a grantee from Square Crypto, so they're funding my open source work. So thank you very much, Square Crypto. Um, and I used to be an enterprise software developer uh, working on financial software. Um, my last place I worked was Disney, and um, now I do Bitcoin. So very excited about that. So we'll move on. So the first part is going to be, um, well, I just went the wrong way. So, oh, sorry, do you want to give your disclaimer? Yeah, big <laughs> disclaimer. Nothing I do at Riot Games is related in any way to Bitcoin or crypto. I, there's, there's nothing I can say with regards to, to, to what Riot is doing. I'm here as a hobbyist and do not represent the <laughs> opinions or intentions of my employer. Yeah, and, and to go along with that, when I was working at Disney and I wanted to work on Bitcoin and get paid to work on Bitcoin, they told me I couldn't, so I left Disney. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's not you know, a choice for everybody, but I'm just saying that it's very common for companies to have problems with people working on other people's software. Um, Okay, so do you want to go I'll, on this yeah, part? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I, I'll, yeah, yeah. Um, so, how how many of the people here present are either software engineers or electrical engineers? Like, raise your hand if you are either one of those. So, okay, that's great. Nobody. So that's perfect, actually, because. Um, you, you, uh, well, so I was at the Miami conference uh, this year, and uh, people is talking about nodes and full nodes and be your own bank and all these things. And, and, and what I see is uh, people doesn't actually take the time first to make sure that, that people can understand what you're talking about. So we're, we're, we're going to spend just like five minutes to kind of like cover a little bit of that. Um, so just, oh, sorry, just, oh, yeah, you did. Yeah. So, so we'll start with, with something very basic. Okay, so we hear computers, nodes, servers, uh, nodes of various, various types. So, what's, um, so what if I tell you that what you're seeing on screen is correct? That's a computer, that's a server, and that's a Bitcoin node. Okay, so what's, what's the difference then? So um, the difference is, well, a computer is just what everybody knows and has at home, a desktop computer, what's a server? So you say computer turned on 24 seven. If, if you don't turn it off and it's available to the world, that makes it a server. So it, it's, it's just that, that's a server. And then if you have a server that's running Bitcoin software, well, that's, that's a Bitcoin server, a Bitcoin node. That's, uh, and so the, the, the long winded way of saying a 24 seven computer running Bitcoin, but that's a Bitcoin node. And, and so computers came, come in different shapes and sizes as well. So we all know the desktop, desktop uh, computer, but you can get something called a small form computer. These are relatively common. You might have used them without realizing, because uh, some businesses use them as their point of sale devices, and like sometimes they are just uh, strapped to the back of a monitor, or, or like when you're paying, it's hidden under the cashier's uh, register, or things like that. And then we have the Raspberry Pis that, if you're a techie, that's like, duh, Raspberry Pi, so everybody knows it. But no, it's, I mean, within the community, they are very popular. Outside of it, they are not. But that's that's just another computer that you can buy, and it's, it's small, and, and, and you, can, you will see how it can be used. Um, and so, and then the next thing, so today we're going to be talking about the different types of uh, Bitcoin nodes that you can have. Uh, there's what we call a full node and what we also call a pruned node. Regularly speaking, when, when people say a Bitcoin node, they default to, say, to a full node. 
that's that's the, 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 the default assumption that you're talking about a uh, full node. Uh, and and we'll, we'll go, we'll, I, I'm going to be focusing on, on how to, uh, we can have a full node at home. And then on the second half, Steve is going to show us how you can have a pruned node. And, and we'll, of course, we'll answer questions and compare them. Um, so, um, but but uh, the, 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 this is this is the quick summary. Maybe you want to. Yeah, add. yeah. So I can talk about the quick summary that. So another name for a full node is a not a full archival node, which basically means on your hard disk is going to be every single Bitcoin block that was ever mined from the Genesis block. The Genesis block being the block that was created by Satoshi as the very first block. So. That's a full node. You have all that data and you validate all that data. Um, so therefore, you're going to need a lot more disk space on a full node around 350 gigabytes plus, which means every block that gets created, you're not going to store it. Um, on the flip side, if you have a prune node, you're only going to store the last, you know, maybe a couple of weeks of blocks because if you're running your own wallet, um, it's only going to track the blocks and the data that's relevant to your wallet. So if you have a full, that's the other difference. It, well, take the next step. So, so you either store all the blocks or you just store recent blocks. In both cases, you're still processing every block. So you're still checking the validity rules. You're still looking at every block. It's just whether you store it or not. So you're still validating all the rules if you're a pruned node. Um, the other big difference is if you're a pruned node, you're not necessarily serving that data to other nodes in the peer-to-peer -peer network. So um, if you're a full node, you are. So if any other node connects to you, they can request any other block on the blockchain. While if you're a pruned node, you can obviously only serve recent blocks. So you're not quite as full a participant. You're not helping the network out quite as much. But it does save a lot of disk space, and it saves a lot of network bandwidth. So this is a valid thing to do if you have limited bandwidth or limited disk space. Um, the, um, the other potential consideration you might have with a full node versus a prune node independent of your disk space or your network bandwidth is what you can plug into it. So if you're going to run something like a BTC pay server, which is like a web store, you can do it on a pruned node or a full node because you just need to know the data for your wallet for that web store. Um, similarly, if you're running a C, no, uh, a C lightning node, which is a, you know, a, lightning, a node on the lightning network, if you're familiar with lightning, that actually will also work with either one. Um, the only one that needs a full node is LND or Eclair, which are two other implementations of lightning nodes, they actually need, they just haven't, I guess, set it up yet to work with a pruned node. Um, so anyway, those are just some basic high level differences between the full and the pruned node. Um, so now Gaston's going to talk about uh, mini servers and full node, mini server full nodes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and so coming back to um, the thing about vocabulary. So now here in this slide, we have mini server. Okay, it's, it's just all interchangeable. Mini computer, a small form computer, between node, mini server. It's all the same thing. Sometimes they call them single board computers. Oh, right. That's yeah, another yeah. name you might hear. Yeah, but it's just a computer you have at home and you never turn it off. And, and so uh, here I have a, a small summary of. Um, uh, generally speaking, what, what the differences are, because in each one of them, you can have your Bitcoin node. You can, you, can, you can put the software there and have a Bitcoin node. It works on all of them. There's, there's nothing uh, preventing you from doing it in any of these options. And so how, how can you start thinking about what's best for you? And, and so that's what I'm trying to do here. Like, I'm not going to tell you um, you should totally buy a Raspberry Pi or a small form computer or go get a new desktop computer. Like, because there's no, there's no single right answer for everybody. And so here the objective is just to kind of put out there the uh, trade-offs. And so, um, uh, oh, and I brought uh, just uh, uh, one of these computers. So, so this this is this is what's a small small form uh, computer, and, and and these ones even have the the holes to just uh, screw them in behind a monitor or a computer, and, and like people, and so people use them like for media centers or, or like uh, home uh, movie centers to store their photos and stuff like that. And so I'll, I'll, I'll get into more a little more detail about these guys, but 
uh, you can see one here. Um, the Raspberry Pi, that's that's the that's the little guy I just I just show you on this slide, and and so so really the prices are relatively uh, similar. Like a, a Raspberry Pi, like the basic components that you need to set up your node, it's going to run you for about three hundred dollars. If you wanna if you wanna add a few other options, it can run you up to four fifty. Uh, with the small computers, um, the range uh, starts about the same. To 180 all the way to 900 and then with a regular home computer you start a little higher for hundred dollars all the way to two thousand dollars right okay and so um, almost and, and, and so there's a price difference and then uh, setup difficulty. Uh, Raspberry Pis and small form computers like these are about the same difficulties, is the same. Doing it on a, de a desktop computer is significantly easier, um, partly because we all are used to these computers. Like they're not brand new for, for us, we've seen them before. Um, so, uh, and, 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 and so, the, the reason why I've showed you the two prices is because um, you're gonna, like, if you go on YouTube or try to search information on the internet, you're gonna find people telling you, uh, oh, you should totally get a two terabytes uh, a hard drive and you should get eight gigabytes of RAM. Like, it's just, it just makes sense and it, it's presented as as the obvious thing to do, but it really isn't. Uh, it really is up to how much you need uh, to, to 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 satisfy your needs. And I I'll say if you if you all, the thing you only care about is I want to run a Bitcoin node and and that's it, then you don't need to spend the extra hundred to one hundred fifty dollars. Uh, and so I, I, I can I can very comfortably say uh, if you just want to try it out and have your own Bitcoin nodes, three hundred dollars and you're good. Um, so um, I've, uh, I've 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 compiled a a full shopping list of what are the things that you need to buy in order to set up one of these nodes. We can we I'll I'll share the link on the on the middle page as a comment just so you have it. And uh, this this uh, this um, this list is not. It's not just me thinking of what are like things that could work. Like like both of the lists in there, I, I did myself. Like I went and bought the, the, the things. Um, the, the list for the small form factor computer is exactly how I put together this, this guy. And then the Raspberry Pi, same thing. I, I didn't bring it with me because it's at home and it's running Bitcoin and it has channels open and so mm. it's a server. So it has to be on 24 seven, couldn't, couldn't bring it. Um, and, and so yeah, like, and um, the list, all the links are Amazon links. Like you can just go there, click, 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 check out, and you're gonna get it in a couple. Of, well, all the pieces you're gonna get in a couple of days. Um, uh, I, I, so you probably saw me. I was messing with the iPad. I was trying to get a video up, up here, but couldn't. So. Uh, technical Maybe we can piece. post it online. Maybe yeah, uh, we can edit the right, web page. Right. Yeah. So for now, I'll, I'll, I just use the, the thumbnail of. Um, so so this is so so if you go and buy the piece, we'll buy the whole shopping list. Um, you you're gonna get all of these things. That's that's what it looks like. And so so from the from the get go. There's there's an immediate trade off that you are hearing that you are uh, taking here. So on that table you have like I don't know thirty to fifty things if you count the screws individually. Uh, if you buy one of these, well, I mean. It's this, the hard drive, and the RAM, and that's it. So that already, mm, it's uh, it's a thing to to think about, because um, because um, this is not hard, but well, if it's your first time and you're feeling a little a little overwhelmed al already by you know new concepts, Bitcoin, we haven't even gotten to the software and the hardware is all of this stuff already. Uh, maybe maybe this is a good option because uh, because uh, it can be easier. Um, um, 
the steps. So again, uh, the steps to buy one of these and put it together, it takes you less than five minutes. Um, the, the time it took me to put this together, even when I already knew all of the steps and had almost memorized all the things that need to be done, even then it took me like 20 to 25 minutes to just like screw things in and put it together. Uh, I mean, it's not that much, 25 minutes, right? But um, when you're doing it the first time, like I did, um, it, it, I, I screwed um, the hard drive before I screwed something else, and then I couldn't connect something, and then have to disassemble and assemble again. And, I mean, it definitely feels like assembling IKEA furniture if you've never put together a computer. Um, and so then we, we get to the software uh, of, of this. Okay, so I have my hardware, I, I have everything I need. So now how do I get everything in, in there? Well, it turns out uh, today uh, is really easy because there's some amazing people out there doing fantastic work. The two, the two projects that I am I'm the most familiar with uh, is uh, getumbrel.com and rustblitz.org. Uh, um, I was I was planning on like maybe putting together like a tutorial on how to do this for you guys, but, but the, the truth is that it was kind of pointless because it's so easy that you just go to the website and follow like two or three screens and you're done. And so I, I'd rather just send you to the, to the original source of information. Like, okay, I have all my hardware. Okay, now just go to that website. And you, they're gonna, so the general steps are, um, like for example, for, for this guy, you get a USB, you connect it to a desktop, desktop computer that you might have. Uh, it's gonna ask you to download two pieces of software, uh, you're gonna use one of them to put the other one on the USB drive. So basically you just use a special software to put more software in that USB drive. You plug it in and you turn it on. And, 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 and that's basically it because, because once, um, once you do that, you're gonna get a, on your screen, a sort of a wizard that's gonna tell you, oh, thank you for downloading the software. I'm gonna help you, and then you just keep clicking yes and okay, and put your password, and and, and, and that's it. That's it. So uh, here, here's the the biggest trade-off between you know doing something like this and doing something like this. If you get a Raspberry Pi, the hardware is a little a little harder, just just because. You have all these pieces. You want to put it together. Once you've put it, you, you've you've done it. The software part is a little easier because because it's just what I told you. Plug it in, turn it on, you're done. Um, when you do something like this, there's a, an extra step uh, that can be a little intimidating because uh, because this 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 um this is this come empty. It's blank. Doesn't have. It's not like when you buy a computer that has Windows or um, iOS, it's it's blank. So you need to put a operating system first, uh, which it's gonna be a Linux uh, uh, operating system. And so so like I get it. Like oftentimes, just the the, the, the pronunciation of the word Linux is already like oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, and and so yeah, that's the trade-off. But the hardware part is easier, so it's kind of like pick your poison kind of thing. Um, and so um, that's um, that's 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 what I have for you um, today. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to uh, message me on, I don't know, Twitter or Telegram. We're gonna give our contact details uh, towards the end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if you want me to help you set up a node, I'll gladly um, do it with you or even for you if you if, if you want a node. It's a good point. If we get enough people who wanna set up a node, we could probably all get together somewhere, bring yeah. our hardware, bring your laptops, and we just do it. So yep. keep that in mind if anybody wants to put one together themselves. Yes, yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I'll take it from here. So I'm gonna talk about the 
easier and a little more complicated way. Um, so just assume, I assume everybody has access to a, just a general purpose computer. That could be a Windows box, could be a Mac, laptop, anything. Um, doesn't even have to be super powerful or even have a huge amount of disk space. So this laptop is just a, a typical MacBook. Um, that um, so that's the easy part. You just you have it's a box you probably have already, or maybe one you one of your old boxes. The hard part is I'm going to show you the steps you need to go through if you want to actually validate that the software you're downloading and installing is the one that's signed by the original. Um, Bitcoin core developers. So um, this is sort of an extra step. So this is this is more. Um, I guess I should start by saying I don't recommend everybody run a full node on their laptops. It's probably better, and in fact, at home, I don't run it on my laptop generally. I run it on a dedicated single board computer that's only running Bitcoin. Um, one of the trade-offs is if you run Bitcoin software on a laptop that you're doing other things with, it's significantly harder to say it's secure because you're running all these other programs, you're surfing the web, you're downloading miscellaneous things. Um, it's open on all sorts of ports. But as a way to learn about a full node and use a full node, and this step that I'm going to show you for validating the software for a full node applies anywhere you install it, whether it's a laptop or a single board computer. If you want to check the binaries you're installing, this is the procedure that you use. These steps I'm going to show you are also on the bitcoincore.org website, um, and we'll share all these links also. Um, so you can get all these instructions there. But um, it's there's a lot of steps, and I try to boil it down to just the just the high levels that you need. Um, so the first thing you need is something called GPG tools or some sort of tool based on GPG. So GPG is GNU Privacy Guard. Uh, it was originally called something called PGP, which is pretty good privacy from Phil Zimmerman back in the 90s or 80s maybe even. Um, I think it was the 90s. Um, so you need this software because what this software does is it gives you access to a tool that allows you to check signatures. So it checks digital signatures um, on files. That's one of the things it can do for you. So you need to get this tool. Um, if you're using a Mac, you can use the Brew tool, which is a nice, easy way to get tools installed in your computer. The next thing you do is you go to bitcoincore.org. This is the website I mentioned, this downloads link. It also has these instructions in a little bit longer detail form um, that I'm summarizing here. So you're going to go to this download link, and you're going to download the core package for your desktop, for your operating system. So it could be Linux, could be Mac, could be Windows. Um, you're going to download that binary. On the, on the Mac, it's a DMG file or DGM file. Um, and then you also download two other files. These are the ones that are really important in addition to the binary, is this thing called binary hashes and hash signatures. Um, so then you've now got these three files. You've got the binary, Bitcoin Core, you've got the hashes, and you have the signature file. Um, you've installed your GPG tool, and now you're going to do something. So you, you might have already had the GPG tool, so that's why they put this step in here, which is people that sign. So the people that are actually signing these binaries, it's not like Satoshi signed it. It's going to be a group of random people. In fact, anybody in this room could sign the binaries and publish through your signatures. Like you build it at home from the source code, and then you validate um, that you followed all the right steps. Um, that's, that's a whole other topic on what steps they want you to follow. But then you could basically sign a binary, give that binary signature to the Bitcoin core team, and they will publish it. So anybody who knows you personally and trusts your signature can use your signature to validate the binaries that run on your machine. We'll get more into that in a minute. Um, Okay, so we have all the tools, we have all the code. Um, there's an extra step in here, which is it's mandatory if you don't know any Bitcoin core developers. So if you happen to know a Bitcoin core developer, you can go up to them and you can find out what their GPG fingerprint for their key is. So every, every cryptographic signature key in GPG has a public key and a private key. So if you're familiar with Bitcoin, that's how Bitcoin works also, public key, private key. And then there's what's called a fingerprint, which is just a short version of their public key. Um, so what this command does is it basically downloads all of the fingerprints for all the public keys from all the core developers. Um, you can actually get this. It's going to be a text file. The text file is called keys.txt. You can actually look through that text file 
um, you can see the name of a developer and their fingerprint for their key or for their public key. Um, for this example, I just downloaded the file and I ran this little script which loads all of them into my machine as keys that my machine knows about. It doesn't say anything about if I trust those keys or not, it just says these are known keys. Um, so that's the first step. We need to get some keys to validate against. Um, the next step is we take our DMG file, in this case, because it's a Mac, and there's a process called hashing. How many people here are familiar with the concept of cryptographic hashing? Okay, yeah, it's a very, that's great, because it's very common in Bitcoin to do this cryptographic hash. You're basically going from some raw bit of data and you're creating a smaller summary number from it that you can go from that number back to the original binary data. Um, so one-way hash. So what you're doing is you're taking this file you downloaded, you're creating its cryptographic hash. The file, the command you're using for that is this thing called SHA sum. So um, what it's doing is it's actually in this file that we downloaded, we downloaded this SHA-256 sum file. It's got the name of the file we're checking, and then it's got what the checksum should be, what the cryptographic checksum should be on that file. So this is just checking that in our, in our file, this SHA-256 sum file, it matches the binary we downloaded. So it doesn't say anything about whether it's the right check. I mean, it's, it's, it's saying this is the checksum it should be. Um, but there's no signatures involved yet. All we've done is we've taken our binary, we've computed the checksum, and we've made sure the checksum of our file matches the checksum in this file, this SHA-256 sum file, sums file. Um, and what you're going to see is you're going to see a message like this. So I'm downloading, this is, um, I believe it's the latest, should be the latest version. There might be a dot one version, but this is version 22 of Bitcoin. Um, it's the one that's going to eventually support Taproot. So you should, if you already have a node, please upgrade it. Um, and then, so okay, so now we, we validated that our binary file matches the checksum in this checksum file. Um, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use GPG verify, and we're gonna, in this other file, so there's another file here called SHA-256sums.asc, and all that file contains, um, actually I'll show you what it contains. Um, uh, so first I'll show you the sums file. So what this is, it's just a bunch of different binaries that are published by the Bitcoin core team and what their checksums should be. So this is the checksum. These are for different operating systems, things like that. Um, so when you, when you do that first command I just showed you, it's going to show you a bunch of errors because all those files, you don't have all these files when you're doing the check. But the one file that you downloaded, whether it's for PC or Linux or whatever, <laughs> will show OK, like it, it passed. Um, then, I know that was really small, just a eye test there. Um, the next file, let's see if I can make it bigger. Oh, I don't wanna do that, sorry. Um, oh. uh, so this file I have to open with, uh, So this file basically has a bunch of signatures in it, and that's all it has, just a bunch of signatures. And these are signatures created by the GPG tool by all the people who made a build of Bitcoin and validated what the checksum should be. So if we then run this other command here, this GBG verify, it's gonna basically take each of those signatures that were produced by these people out there, and it's going to check that that other file, that SHA-256, that the one that actually had the checksum in it, that, that that file was signed by these people. So it's not, it's sort of an indirection. You're, you're checking, you're just, they, they didn't sign the binary file, they signed the file that had the checksum for the binary file. It's, it's a bit of a thing, but, um, but you'll see this a lot for security software where you do a checksum and you get a signature of the checksum. So in this case, um, I just pulled out one of the outputs from this command, and this just shows one of these developers, this person, Michael Ford. Um, he goes by Fanquake, if you've seen him out there, and the, is a, one of the core developers. And his fingerprint is E77, so if, if I actually happen to know um, Michael Ford, I could ask him what the checksum was for his Public, for his public key, he would tell me this, this fingerprint, and then I would see when I ran this command that he did sign that binary. So that's, that's this, the, the fun of 
checking your binaries. And this could apply to Bitcoin, it could apply to a Lightning binary, it could apply to any binaries out there. Yes? Why, why should I do this? Why is this important? Very good question. So the reason you're doing all of this is even though you're downloading it over HTTP on a well-known website, you don't know for sure there isn't some man in the middle attack, that somebody spoofed that IP, spoofed that certificate on their HTTP website and gave you a bogus download. And if you download a Bitcoin, any Bitcoin software or any security related software that hasn't been you have, that hasn't been signed with a validated signature, there is that chance somebody could insert malware into it and basically steal your Bitcoin. So I'm not saying it's likely, it's pretty unlikely, but it's a good thing to understand how to do if you ever were working at a company or you did happen to have a lot of Bitcoin that you needed to secure, you should understand this process to validate the signatures on the binaries that you use. Okay, so, so now we've downloaded our binaries and there's one extra little step if you're using a Mac that I thought I would just throw in here. Um, so the Mac won't install, if you're running on a Mac, and I think Windows might do this too, it has its own system for checking signatures. So Microsoft or Apple, they sign the programs that they let you install. This was not signed by Apple. This was signed by a bunch of random people out there on the internet. So Apple won't load it. Um, so you have to go through a couple steps. So you just, you try to install it. You're gonna get this error message. And then you're gonna have to go to your Apple system preferences, security and privacy. Um, and you're gonna basically just have to say, ignore that it's not signed by Apple and install it anyway. Otherwise it won't install it at all. Um, the other, the other so, okay, yeah, so that's the first step. You go to Apple security preferences, privacy, and you're gonna see a little notice at the bottom that asks you, do you still wanna install it? And then you say yes, because um, you've already checked your signature yourself. Um, so in this particular setup, the other thing I'm doing is a prune node. So I don't have a lot of disk space on this machine. Um, I just want to have a full node working. Um, so this is great if you um, have a new wallet, so you're not importing a wallet from somewhere else. So it's possible that you had a Bitcoin wallet somewhere else and you just want to export the keys and import them into a new node. That's not good. It's not a good idea to do with a prune node because the prune node is only checking for recent blocks. So this is just a great scenario if you just either don't. You want to use this node not as a wallet because you can use a node as just a source of information about block data, um, or you're just using it as a new wallet. Um, so when I installed it on this machine earlier this week, it took about 37 hours to download all the blocks. Now keep in mind, even though it's a prune node, it still downloads every single block, checks all the validity rules, checks, you know, checks everything that a full node would check. It just doesn't keep the blocks when it's done unless it's a recent block. Um, so it takes a long time, um, but it, it will finish if, you, if you're patient. Um, so I'm gonna bring up my full node here. Uh, so once you have it installed, at least on this kind of operating system, you'll see it's called Bitcoin QT. So Bitcoin QT is a binary that includes the full node software, the wallet software, and this GUI software, so this UI. Um, every time you start it up, so in this case it's been off, I drove from home over here, it was unconnected to the network, so it's out of sync. So basically for the last maybe hour or so, it's been out of touch with all the other Bitcoin nodes, so it's gonna sync up. I'm, Pretty sure it's going, it's, okay, so it's syncing now. Um, but it didn't lose that many blocks. It's gonna sync up in a minute, maybe two minutes. Um, so the first thing I was gonna show you with this node, let me see if I had a screen for it. Okay, so I, I, I just wanted to show that there's a couple things you can do without any real technical knowledge. You can go to Windows and it shows you a couple things. I can go information, you can get the version. You can see it's 0.22. Um, I'm on the main net, and the current block height is uh, 706,366, and the last block time, so I'm up to 3, 313. So it's up to sync, it's up, it's up to date. Um, the other thing you can check is some of your network traffic. What I find interesting is peers. So when you run a full node, there are some techniques it uses to, if you're a brand new node, to find other Bitcoin nodes. So it, it goes to DNS, it gets some seed nodes. From those seed nodes, it finds other nodes on the network. And without you having to tell it how to connect to the network, it will connect to the network. Um, so here you can see all the random people you're connected to. Yes? Now what's the difference between a full relay and block relay um, on the type right now. I see, right. Um, I 
believe the block, you know, that's a good question. I should know that. Um, I'm not sure. I think I, I have a feeling that block relays might just be relaying um, new blocks as they're mined, mm -hmm. and the full relay full relay would be would be uh, sharing all of the transactions, even if they're unconfirmed. Yeah. So if you're transferring transactions before they're confirmed, then there's going to be a lot more bandwidth because you know there's just it's it's changing all the time, and that's how if you're it's especially true if you're like a miner, you need to know about those unconfirmed transactions, or even if you're like a web store and you want to see the unconfirmed transactions. Um, but a lot of applications just want to see the final blocks. So you can be up here and just do that. There's a setting probably somewhere in the config where you can tell it, don't worry about the mempool. Um, okay, so that's the basics of just setting up, starting a node. So the other thing you need to think about if you wanted to run a wallet on this, on your machine here, this pruned node. Um, and another thing, as I said before, since it's a general purpose PC, it's not super secure. So I wouldn't recommend doing this for a lot of Bitcoin. But if you want to just have a few Bitcoin to play with or a few Satoshis, Satoshis. to play with, <laughs> yeah, and it can't, it, it can't be it can't be too low because if it's too low a Sato number of Satoshis, you're going to have there's a there's a low or limit too, but yeah, a few thousand Satoshis maybe, or a few hundred thousand Satoshis um, be okay. So um, two things is you can make an encrypted wallet. So it's a good idea to have an encrypted wallet um, if you're going to have any Satoshis at all on there. Um, that just means that if somebody steals your computer, they're not going to be able to take your value if they don't know your password. The flip side of that is if you don't remember your password, you will lose your Bitcoin. You will never get them back. Um, so if you do do an encrypted wallet, be sure to save it somewhere safe, and then nobody else can find. Um, the other thing I recommend doing is making a descriptor wallet. Um, it's not strictly necessary, but descriptor wallets are sort of the future of Bitcoin wallets. It makes it much easier to back up the metadata around your wallet addresses. Um, so it's a somewhat recent feature of Bitcoin Core that you can create a descriptor wallet, and you can do it now through the GUI. So I would recommend, So you, I don't know if it's big enough to see, but there's just a little checkbox, descriptor wallet, little checkbox, encrypted wallet. You're going to get this warning, like I just said, about if you have encrypted wallet. Okay, so now some of the fun things you can do once you have this set up. How are we doing on time? I don't know. Oh, okay, it's 20 after. I'll just kind of breeze through some of this stuff. Maybe like 10 more minutes. Okay, yeah, that's should be good. Um, so you have various options when you um, set up your wallet. Well, one thing you should know how to do is back it up. So. There's just a simple command here, file backup wallet. That just creates a, it's still encrypted, but just a backup file that you can, you know, then save. It's just a, it's a safer way than just doing a normal backup. Like it, it makes sure that there's no current changes happening in the wallet. It makes a backup file for you. Um, also a good thing to do if you're upgrading your node, make a backup and then upgrade your software just in case. Oh, I don't want to do that. Um, so let's see. So a couple things you can do, like receiving Bitcoin. And you'll find that the Bitcoin Core client is definitely not meant for novices in the sense that it has all the options that they could fit in there. So it's not necessarily options everybody needs, but they are fun to look at, which is another reason just for educational purposes. It's nice to look at it. So if I hit the receive button here, uh, you can give it a label. That's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, I guess it's not too many options here, but you can basically generate a BEC32 address or non-BEC32 address. Um, they call that sometimes a legacy address. So BEC32 address is if you're familiar with SegWit, that means it's a SegWit address. You should always do SegWit addresses. It'll be a smaller transaction. Um, it'll save you fees. Um, that's all there is to receiving. And then if you just say create a new address, you're going to get all this great stuff. You can give your friends your barcode and get them to send you Satoshis. Um, the, the more complicated thing is, send, is sending Bitcoin. So this is where there's really a lot of different options. Um, the biggest thing you can do if you really wanted to be cool, and you can actually pick which Bitcoin inputs you want to put into a transaction. So with this little option, I only have one input. I only put one transaction into this wallet. But say you had, say you'd received Bitcoin from three different people, and you wanted to spend just one of those without spend like you wanted to select which inputs you spent. Like one of them, you just didn't want to move. You could do it with this screen. 
Um, the other thing you can do is um, you can adjust your fees. So here you can do per kilo, so by default it's per kilo, uh, per virtual byte. Um, and it's in Bitcoins or I guess Satoshis. So in this case, it's defaulting to a thousand Satoshis. Uh, that's really high right now. You probably should adjust that by hand and put it a little bit lower. I'm not exactly sure how it figures it out, but um, the minimum thousand is pretty big right now. Um, the other thing you can do, oh, I guess you can choose this option to say recommended, and it'll estimate it from the blockchain, because that is a nice thing. This is something you can really only get from a core node, is you can estimate the block fees yourself, because it's looking at all the block fees from all the prior blocks, so it's a nice thing to have. Um, you have all that data locally. Um, the other option that you may not see on every wallet, but I think eventually you will see on most wallets, is this replace by fee, which means you could actually set a really, if it's not an urgent transaction for you, you could set a really low fee and then see if it goes through. And if it doesn't go through, you can actually bump the fee on that transaction before it gets confirmed. Um, so that's, if you're not in a big hurry, you can just set your fee low, make sure to check this box, enable replace by fee, put it out there if it's not confirmed in enough time and you think the average fee rate has gone up enough, you can do a, a process called bump, uh, bump fee, and um, this lets you enable that ahead of time. Okay, so um, I was gonna see, so I think it's, uh, yeah, so I can't show you, I'd have to do an in-process transaction to show you bumping, but we don't need to get into that. Okay, what else do they have here? So, um, Okay, so the other thing I just wanted to see, this is trying to show you things that you can only really do with a full node. It has something called a console window. And the console window basically gives you a ton of technical, technical goodies. Um, I'll just talk them through. One of the things is you can do list descriptors. I'll show you that one, because it's fun. Um, so if you go list descriptors, it's gonna show you the descriptors for your wallet. It's pretty, looks pretty tech, techy, but essentially the critical thing is this line. And what it's doing is for your, for this wallet we just created, this covers both the public key for that wallet, as well as the type of addresses it can create. Um, and it shows that it's got, a, this dash zero means it's your receive wallet, and then there's also a dash one, or slash one, so that's your change addresses, so, in most cases, you probably won't need this, but if you are, if you do want to restore your wallet to another um, piece of software, you do need this kind of information about the um, HD path, they call it, and the, the, um, the type of scripts that are being created. So in this case, it's a witness public key hash script, but your wallet on Bitcoin Core will actually do all the script types, whatever you want. Um, and then the other ones, um, you can do get new address. So if you wanted to get a new address of one of these other types, you can do that from here. You can say get a, a pay, to script, pay to script hash of a SegWit address, these various options. Um, if you wanted to get information about the blockchain, you can also do that. You can get the blocks. Um, this is another interesting one. You can say soft fork. So, um, so get blockchain info is sort of a catch-all for a bunch of different blockchain data. And one of the interesting things you can see on this, so you know, there was recently the Taproot activation. You can actually see via this screen that the soft fork called Taproot um, is locked in. So that means all the miners agreed to lock this in, um, and, but it's not activated yet. So it says minimum activation type. So this is basically, you can learn yourself from the Bitcoin blockchain when Taproot's gonna activate. It's gonna activate at 709, 632, um, and it's not activated, so it's false. So if you have a full node running, you can actually walk, watch Taproot activate in a month or so. <laughs> So that's pretty cool. Um, you can also find out the difficulty. Uh, this is command called list band. Since you're talking to all these peers, it is possible for your node to just decide to ban one of your peers because it's given you bad transaction data. Um, so there could be a list there. I've, if you're doing development, this is a useful command because you might be giving your node bad information while you're testing, and then you might 
band yourself. I've done that before. And then you need to find that out by using list band. Um, the other, and so this is, this is a command, this, this add node command is useful for if you're building your own single board computer node and you want to make sure that your desktop node always includes the node that you built that has potentially a full node, uh, potentially full unpruned blockchains. So you can basically tell, tell this node to always peer with one of the other nodes you have at home. And that's a great idea too, you'll trust yourself. Okay, so that's I have. So that's all I have. Um, the basic overall message here is run your own node. It's um, good for your privacy, good for security, and it can be fun. So um, uh, I'll just add a little quote here. So I won't read the whole thing, but it's a the basic quote here from Satoshi Nakamoto is that this is, that Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's not meant to be a centralized network. Um, and the way you do that is you run a full node at home. So that's how you become part of this peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and that's how we gain a little bit of freedom against the surveillance state. So it's you know, lots of good reasons to run a full node. So maybe we'll do a little question and answer yeah. now. So did anybody else have any questions about running a full node or? Uh, desktopper, yes. So I have a kind of shortcut for not knowing Bitcoin core developers when you're checking signatures and fingerprints. Uh -huh. I'm curious what you think this is. Mm -hmm. There's lots and lots of uh, you know YouTube videos where people go through the process of validating things, mm -hmm. and very often in that you'll see on their screen what the you know signature of the fingerprint is. And uh -huh. I find that if you find a couple of those and they're several years old, <laughs> uh, that it, it strikes me as uh, very likely that it's the correct signature yeah. for fingerprint. So. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Put that out there because I don't know. Yeah, you know, I mean, doing something in real time and you're paranoid about a man in the middle attack. Then, yeah. You know. The other thing is that I didn't mention was that GPG has this thing called a chain of trust. So if you know somebody who knows somebody who knows a core developer and there's a chain of signed trusted signatures or tra uh, trusted keys, then you can also gain a level of trust that way, just through that, that web of trust, they call it. So it could be from a YouTube video. It could also be just from someone you meet at a conference that validates their fingerprint of their public key for you. So yeah, there are various ways to do that. Anybody have any other questions? I feel like core devs are nicer than you'd think. You don't have to <laughs> have a whole game plan. You could just DM them. Usually, if you just explain it, that is very creative. But I think that has to be said yes to them, right? That's <laughs> true. That's true. I think as many as feel trustworthy and hope that one is correct. I, I heard a story recently from somebody who was at a meetup where there were core developers. And um, they had something called a signing party where the core developers that were there and the other people that happened to be there that weren't core developers, they just validated each other's keys all together while they happened to be there. So those things happen too. And that's a way to sort of start that chain of trust too, web of trust. Right. I have a question. If you yeah. have, can you have one full node and then a prune node? Yes. So you could have you don't have to have the information in all, all of them? Yep, that's actually, personally, that's what I do at home. I have a full node running all the time, sitting in the basement, and then any other nodes I have, I just run them in prune node, pruned mode, and I trust my full node that I have running at home. So yeah, you can do that. And actually, we didn't talk about it, but the other thing that it's probably a good idea to either use Tor or use a VPN, because like I said, you're connecting to all these random nodes on the internet. They're going to get your ISP address. They're going to know they're connected to someone. So it's not, you kind of have to assume that your ISP now knows you're running Bitcoin. If you want to avoid that situation, it's better. There's some configurations you can do before you even start your full node to tell it to connect. You can set up a, a Tor relay or Tor node on your same machine and then have your Bitcoin node do all of its communications through that Tor node. Or if you want to keep it simple, you can just run a simple VPN, pick a good VPN, and that'll also sort of obfuscate yeah. who you are and that you're running Bitcoin. Yeah. And, and um, so that's and, and that's also uh, why the projects uh, that I shared earlier are so good because all of that works out of the box. Yeah, that's great. When you when you for example Umbral, it works uh, through Tor by default, and so it protects your privacy even if you're not trying. 
Yeah, it will take longer to download over Tor, probably yeah. a lot longer, but, yeah. and then to have a kind of a combo deal, you can set up a full node completely on Tor, get it all synced up, and then you have a prune node like this, you tell this, you can also tell your prune node to only connect to your node, to not try to connect yeah. out to the internet, only connect to your node, potentially over Tor also, in case you're traveling. Yeah. So that's another great way to mix and match pruned and non-pruned nodes. Yeah. Uh, syncing, syncing the Raspberry Pi with Umbrel mm -hmm. over Tor, it took me a little over a week. Okay, that's not too bad. <laughs> that's yeah. not terrible. Yeah, pretty good. And is there a different setup if you're just setting up one node as to you're setting up 10 or 20? Is the software different or I mean, is the setup different? No, it's, it's pretty much the same. The only difference really, I mean, the primary difference is, you know, if you're configuring to use Tor or not use Tor, if you're configuring to connect to your own nodes, um, and then if you're yeah, pruned or not pruned is a big difference. And is there a difference in how much more it'll mine if, if you get well, more expensive hardware or? Well, these, so these nodes won't do any mining. So this is not set up for mining. It's really just set up for syncing the blocks that are created by yeah. other miners. Now, if you are gonna be running mining equipment, um, you know, that would be obviously it's a separate setup. And you, but you still, in general right now, if you're mining through like a mining pool, you probably don't need your own full node, but there are some mining protocols that are being developed where you would need your own full node. Yeah. And for various yeah. reasons, it's and, hard to get into, but. And, and, and to add to, uh, I'm just, um, so yeah, the, the, um, the, so the node is not doing any mining. It's just validating the transactions. But to answer your question, uh, bigger, well, beefier hardware is gonna validate those transactions faster. That's and true. So like, for example, so I just mentioned the, the Raspberry Pi, it took over seven days. I don't remember, maybe eight, nine. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one, it's, it's a little more powerful than a Raspberry Pi. Uh, not like a whole lot, maybe 30-40%. Uh, and same thing, Umbral over the door. Uh, it took under 72 hours to sync, a little less than three days. Yeah. So, so even just that extra power, pretty much cutting half the, the time it took to sync. So it, it does affect, but you know, um, Maybe seven days versus three days doesn't really matter. Yeah, and once you're synced up, as long as you stay connected, you know you you don't. It doesn't take much because you know you get a new block every ten minutes. Sorry, there was a question up here first, and then. Um, I can't remember it. Okay, we can come back. We can come back. <laughs> yeah, it's about you know the downloading we have to do before we can even get tour. Um, does like the routers with the VPNs in it like mm -hmm. slow down the process it? Of, uh, That's a good. So the what I've found is the bandwidth, like for a typical person in a Western country that has cable modem or something, bandwidth's not really the bottleneck. So if you're going through a VPN or you're going through Tor, even, it's not really the biggest bottleneck. It's actually CPU power, as Gasan was just saying. Yeah. It's doing a lot of cryptographic validation on 12 years worth of data, you know, gigabytes worth of data. That's actually where it takes a lot of time. So the bandwidth if you're running on a VPN or you're running on Tor, you're running on some sort of, even a somewhat smaller internet connection, that's probably not gonna be the thing slowing you down. Yeah. It'll probably be your CPU. Yep. Um, and and, and to, to highlight the, the impact of power, uh, so the Raspberry Pi, that, that's a board that comes with a quad core CPU. So it's like, okay, so it has four cores, sounds fast, <laughs> right? But they run at 1.5 gigahertz. This guy has only two cores, but each core runs at 2.5 gigahertz. So, so just the raw power of the CPU is what sped it up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You have a question? Um, yeah, one thing I was just going to say was I think the point that you guys had about everybody's use cases being different right. was a good one. And I like the emphasis on hardware. But there's also <laughs> other options depending on your use case. So um, BTC Pay Server came up at one point, mm -hmm. and we were working with activists recently. We have hardware with us, but for most people, you could do what's called a Luna node too, and it costs about 10 bucks a month if you aren't ready to take the plunge right away or if you don't need to run a full node right away, I would encourage it, but 
Um, say you are just trying to raise money for your nonprofit or initiative or trying to open up a pizza shop or whatever the case may be, um, there are other options that if you can't get the hardware right away or you don't know what to trust, I think Raspberry Blitz is a great one. Um, but there's also more available yeah. out there. So that's like a cloud hosted sort of one? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There, I mean, that's, there's that's many true. options. They just happen to support the project. So we use yeah. them. Because no, I mean, that's, they give us free access. That's a good point. You can actually, and you can get a cloud node, I mean, especially for a prune node too, where a lot of times if you're on a cloud node, you need gigs and gigs of data, that's expensive. But for a prune node, you can definitely run it in the cloud. It's probably a great way to get started. You can you can create a, you know, you can get a, a cloud hosted little computer running Linux for pretty cheap. So, and, and it does have the advantage of always being on, like you don't have to worry about your power going out or your, you know, your dog tripping over the cord and it's unconnected or whatever. So there's yeah. some definite advantages there too. Um, I, I can't avoid to let the maxi in me get out of it you know, <laughs> and say, yeah, that's a great idea as a pedagogic, pedagogical tool to yeah. learn. Yeah. But if you do that, that's not peer to peer. I'm with right. you. I'm with you. But not <laughs> yeah. everybody, I mean, it depends where you live in the world, right? right. Not everybody, yeah. if so to say, yeah. we are in China. If someone was yeah, you can't, you can't, time, yeah, <laughs> having a $300 gadget on the living room, it's, it's as, yeah. as, just as much as having a gold bar on the floor, right? Absolutely, and yeah. there are physical risks if you have some of this stuff in your yeah. country. So, you know, your privacy, I think, is dependent on where you are, but I'm, I'm totally with you. If, I can't, if you can't yeah. run, this is the way to go. If not, there are... Yeah, risks. right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, so much. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my question is not directly about Bitcoin, so that's all right. Yeah. Uh, it's about the Lightning Network. So mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious about kind of both your thoughts on it. So I know kind of about both sides of the argument. On one side, people think that we have to have a scaling solution to, for mass adoption, especially institutional adoption. Mm -hmm. Then there's the other side that's completely anti-Lightning and scaling solution, saying that you know, it could potentially be centralized and not really part of the core vision. I know some of those people are core devs too. So mm -hmm. just kind of curious where you guys fall. Which side of uh, I, I I'm willing to give you my um, opinion based on the limited knowledge that I have, because I'm far, far from being like expert on lightning or the alternatives. But um, with the little I know, I'll say that um, yeah, Lightning is the most popular solution for Bitcoin right now, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be the only scaling solution forever. And it, I, I wouldn't be shocked if one or two years from now, somebody comes up with something different that causes a uh, lightning network to, um, you know, um, sail into the sunset. For sure. like, I mean, it could happen. I, I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not saying it'll happen. Like, maybe it won't. Maybe we'll have lightning for the next ten years. I, I don't know, but 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 I'm not. Um, I'm not too uh, concerned about uh, the destiny of the network being sealed now with Lightning Network. Right. Yeah. Do, you, do you think scaling solutions are necessary? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I also think all the options are good. And the important thing is that the core network, I mean, the, the base layer one network has to be distributed. It has to be censorship resistant. It has to have all those properties. It is going to get more expensive. The fees will go up. So we do need scaling solutions. And I think all scaling solutions need to be tried and, and, and we'll probably end up in a world where we have multiple of them. Some of them are going to be like one scaling solution is literally to have a custodial bank. One, cause you know, one solution will be have lightning. There's going to be side chains. There's going to be all these options. I think the non-custodial ones are obviously better, but all these things are going to help scale the network and they're all necessary. So it's all good. Yeah. Yes. So going back to the use case scenario, let's say we were in China, who mm -hmm. has, at my last check, banned all Bitcoin transactions. I don't know if they've changed their mind. I don't know. I don't check the news that often. Uh, let's say we've got our full node set up, you know, and we're in China and have some plausible reason that we would have that sort of network traffic. Uh, in your mind, would you feel comfortable just continuing on, you know, yawn, whatever you say, you know? Uh, Chinese government, no, and just keep keep doing your Bitcoin transactions. Do you feel like that would give you the level of you know, privacy, security, censorship resistance 
that think, you wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't feel like uh oh like I'm not doing <laughs> what I'm doing. I think in any country like that, you have to be running a VPN or Tor or both. I think it's you know you're very very obviously running Bitcoin if you're not doing those things. Yeah. So there's a lot of countries. It's not just China. There's India. There's um, you know other countries that don't like Bitcoin, and I think it's a good idea, including this country. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? And and yeah. anything that's recorded on the internet, such as your traffic patterns, will be recorded forever. So it's not a bad idea to think, even if you're not doing anything that's worrisome now, it could be worrisome later. So it's not a bad idea to just take those precautions. And VPNs are cheap. It's a, I'm not sure how much I recommend them because they're not all great. Some of them are just as surveillance as anything else. But um, Tor is pretty easy to run, so it's a good thing to run. Um, but yeah, I would say probably everybody should at least be thinking ahead that maybe it won't be, even in this country, something that you want to publicize that you're running. So a good idea to run Tor. Yeah. Dirty money goes through your lightning node. Unbeknownst Possibly, to you, it could happen. Someone yeah. Someone decides to charge you as a middleman in that. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, it doesn't. Who knows what the pretext will be? But yeah, there could be anything like that. So yeah, and yeah, that's it. So I'm sorry. Behind. In oh, this will be the last question. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, I so I, I guess 22.0 it, it kind of sounds like it's ITP. Yes, um, that's a good point. I, have, have you? I haven't tried I2P. I know that it's a new option. There's another option also called CJDNS. CJDNS. Um, and those are two new options in addition to Tor. Um, I think I've only read about them. I've never tried them, so I can't say how well they work. I know that part of what you're looking for from a secure connection is you want to be in the biggest crowd. So, um, you know, Tor is a pretty big network, so you have a bit more non anonymity there. If you're running something like I2P or whatever it's called, the I2P protocol, you might have a smaller network that you're a part of, so that could be a concern. But I think those options are all good, and it's probably even worth trying to connect to multiple of them. That's probably your best option if, you, if you're trying to be really anonymous. Uh, the full node can talk on multiple protocols, and it can talk, you know, um, you can connect to peers on all those networks. So, you know how to do that? Um, I've only tried setting up with Tor, but um, if you're interested, contact me and we can try to figure out the commands. I'm sure there's a way to set it up in the config file. Oh, we didn't show the slide. Which, which slide? For uh, if people want to. Oh, yeah, yeah. So us. We'll, we'll put all our information. Actually, our information, our, our Twitter information is already on the Bitcoin, uh, on the uh, Bitcoin, uh, BitDevs LA website for this meetup. So you can find our Twitter stuff there. Um, we'll put them here too. Is there a telegram here? We don't have a telegram. Yeah, we have like do we? Southern, Southern California. Southern California. Southern yeah. California Bitcoin telegram group. Gotcha. Yeah. It, was, it like started in LA and then OC people joined and then SD people joined. So it's, like a, it's a giant party in there. Yeah. So it's a good one to. Yeah, I think the SD people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll check that one too. So let's stop there. All right, okay. guys, let's give them a hand.